advertisement. Can you read this? LUC Good stands for? Latin New City College. It's a fantastic place. That's where I teach. Now I'm going to take off my advertisement without losing my shirt. Put on my inspirational Dare to be Stupid Nerd Night related wardrobe. OK, costume change successful. That's the only one, sorry. OK, so uh, my title of my talk is Water Fails. And um, uh, we're going to get into that topic immediately because I don't want to waste your time. The, the thing is, is that this glass uh, will be half full, half empty, half full. I'm not quite sure. It's going to be a little bit of uh, depression, a little bit of reality. Hopefully, you'll take something out of this. It's ex very exciting. This is the title of my book. You should remember it because it's a free download. I'll tell you the URL later. It's called, uh, it's very similar to that name. So why am I here is the question. Uh, and I forgot to go back to the, th the, the biggest question, which is this. What is a nerd? What is a nerd? Who has a definition of a nerd? You're all here at Nerd Night. What does that mean? Brave people? Really smart. Really smart, OK. Someone who's just ridiculously into something. Into something. Totally into something. Hello, hello, anyone? Obsessed with something. Obsessed with something. Meticulous. Meticulous. My version of it is a nerd is someone who gives a shit. Right? And thank God you're all here right now because you're listening to me and, and my, my co-speaker on a beautiful Friday night. So uh, thank you very much for coming. And I am someone who gives a shit. I'll tell you about water by going to this slide, which is why am I here. And it's because I, uh, uh, I grew up in San Francisco, by the way, California. And I have a lot of passion about telling people that they're wrong. If I think so. Now, I try to be wrong in a fairly justified way. That's the, called the economic science. I'm an economist. So um, uh, that's my career, basically. Uh, and I'm a water economist. Did you see that? Yeah. Yes. You want to see that again? So people say, what does a water economist do? And they think, oh, that's what water economists do. You know what this is? <laughs> this is a water model. No, really, what do water economists do? That's my job. What do you think a water economist does? Anybody? Looks after the water. OK. Another job? Another, uh, another uh, no, lost. Oh. Saves water? Saves water. Yes, I have it in my pockets. What does a water economist do? Models water. What? Models water. Models water. No, she's very better at that, at that than me. <laughs> oh, sorry. No wonder you don't, I don't have your attention. Go back. <laughs> Look at me. OK, what do econ water economists, that's what I do. Uh, that's my, my job title. But a water economist is someone, I'm going to have to slide backwards and forwards a little bit because I'm, I'm trying to stay uh, in tempo for you. A water economist is somebody who um, talks about bad news, as in what we, saw, we call no free lunch, right? Economics is called the dismal science. Has anybody ever heard that expression, the dismal science? Dismal science. Does dismal science, does that make you think, like, I don't want to talk, listen to this person because it might be a depressing person? Yeah? But you know what? The origin of the dismal science is because a guy was talking about this really annoying economist who kept saying that slavery is a bad idea because costs and benefits are not working out for those slaves. Literally. This is not, I'm not even kidding. So the dismal science is the, is the science of telling people something they don't want to hear, but we come from a desire to try and, and help society in a sense, right? And, and that's the, the good side of dismal science. So uh, yes, we do work with water models, but we also work with things like this. This is the statistics from the Millennium Development Goals. Remember there was this goal to uh, reduce, this is, the, this is the actual goal, so if you don't remember, it's OK. Reduce by half the number of people who lack access to clean drinking water. Does that sound familiar? Some people yes, some people no. The Millennium Development Goals, does that sound familiar? OK, that was one of those things. So one of these goals is reduced by half. Now, unfortunately, what happened is the bureaucrats decided to change the definition to reduce by half the number of people lacking access to an improved water source. And if you think about that, that actually means a pipe. And if there's no water coming out of the pipe, that doesn't count. And if the water coming out of the pipe is not good for you, that doesn't count either. So it was up to people like me to say, well, look, this is what you said you did. You have only a billion people on the planet that lack access to an improved water source. But economists like me would say, but wait, we have like 2.5 or 
uh, or, or 3 billion people, so triple the number of people actually act, lack access to clean water. And if you go to the UN and you say, you missed your goal by 2 billion, they're not going to be very happy, right? But they did declare victory. You can look at the press releases. And my job is to, to kind of bring the, the dismal news and say, no, you haven't finished the job yet. You need to actually do what you say you're going to do. Did I say this was going to be a down talk? It's going to go up. Don't worry. OK, so uh, why are these? So you say, OK, you just point at things and you say, that's a terrible thing. And, and then you say, wait, I live in the Netherlands. Who here drinks the tap water in the Netherlands? Who, drinks the, who doesn't drink the tap water in the Netherlands? OK, a good, good answer. No one's going to kill you on the, on the floor here. But um, it turns out that dr clean drinking water at your tap is a question of technology and money, which the Dutch have managed to put together in such a combination that you can drink water at a price of about 1 euro uh, 60 or so, including taxes, per 1,000 liters. right? And people around the world are having problems getting clean drinking water, 3 billion of them, apparently. So is it because of a lack of water or a lack of technology? Actually, no, right? Because the people that live in the, the poorest ghettos of the, of the world, in the favelas, they actually pay 10 times the price of bottled water because they're buying it from pirate deliveries, and they're drinking the water, and they're probably getting sick because the water comes from anywhere. And so you might think, OK, so it's, what is the problem? The problem is uh, what I would call governance, or you might call corruption, you might call management, you might call politics. And that's what we have to talk about. So what I work on is this water governance thing. And the trickiest thing with water governance is that we all know there's a problem. And the question is, who's going to run towards the Persians to take on the problem? And it's called a collective action problem. Everybody wants someone else to go first. Right? Because I'm really busy. I have a career. I have kids. I have a commute. Can you please take care of our drinking water problem? But meanwhile, Sao Paulo is running out of water, or uh, you don't want to drink the water in Cairo because it's really from the Nile, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So what we try and do is say, there's a problem. There's a governance problem. And we're trying to diagnose that problem and find ways to, to address it. Right? That's what I would call my job as a water economist. Now. Um, how do we do that? We don't just sit up here and talk and, and, and earn you know, ridiculous amounts of uh, nerd money, uh, nerd night money. You know, I, I, my pockets are stuffed with all these euros. But what we do is we try and come up with you what you might call like no regrets solutions. So I'm going to give you a couple right now just to warm you up. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you about why it's actually hard to do those solutions. And then I'm going to tell you about why there's not more people like me on uh, addressing the world, because uh, it's very uh, uh, obvious kind of stuff. So uh, here's the first thing. These, these illustrations are from my free to download book. Did I tell you that? So um, here you see free water versus 10 cents a, a, a glass or whatever. The biggest problem that we have with water supply uh, irre irregularities, lack of water supply, or water scarcity and shortages. I came from California, which is regularly in the news for having no water, is because it's given away in some way for free. And what we need in the, in the water sector is the water engineers need enough money to run the system. And uh, the water, uh, uh, the resource managers, which the Dutch don't have a problem with, right? There's too much water in this country. But the resource managers need to be able to raise the price or somehow get people to use less water than there is supply. Otherwise, you run out, right? And we see these cities running out of water all the time. So water economists say we have to raise the price of water. And then what's the, the first objection when you say we have to raise the price of water? What's the first objection? Too expensive for the poor. Too expensive for the poor. And uh, the first answer, of course, is when we run out of water, the first people to get screwed are the poor. The second answer is that you can actually raise the price of water. And I have a, a, vi a very nice way of talking about that, such that everybody pays too much for the actual cost. The total demand is lower so that there's not a shortage. And the extra money that comes in helps the poor. You can actually change these systems to address that problem. For example, example, example. So this is just one. Another one, water safety. The Netherlands, right? The world capital of water safety. What's one thing that we should not be doing in terms of floods and water safety? We shouldn't subsidize people living in flood plains, right? I come from the United States. You've heard of New Orleans, right? They, they had this kind of flood thing going on in New Orleans. They're like, we're going to make sure that we pay for everything so that you can live in the middle of that flood plain again. Oh, and if there's another flood, we'll take care of you. So guess what? 
People live in floodplains, right? I, I, I don't think the Dutch would put up with that, honestly. That's a waste of money, really, right? So, uh, but other cultures, they're not quite up to this uh, standard of logic, and so we have to point out these things to them. Another one, sustainability. If there's no water taken from the environment, we're going to die, right? There's no uh, irrigation, there's no drink water, there's no uh, hygiene, so we know we have to take water out of the environment. But if you take all the water out of the environment, we also die, right? And it seems like this would be obvious, but some places can't figure this out. And you have, for example, from my country again, the Colorado River. Who's heard of the Colorado River? The Grand Canyon, right? That's where that goes. The Colorado River has not reached its delta for 20 years, 18 of the last 20 years. What that means is that one of the biggest ecosystems of the Western United States doesn't exist. It's a desert, right? Because they can't figure out how to leave enough water in the environment. That's not good for anybody in this world. It's not good for those communities and so on. So, oh yeah, there's good news coming. Don't worry, don't be depressed. Okay, so why is it so hard to have change? You saw that square. So I have these very simple answers. Why is it so hard to have change? The simple answer is uh, there are people that don't want to change because they are making uh, better benefits today from uh, uh, the current screwed up situation than they would make if we change the situation. This is, this is known as the, the winners uh, make the rules. Uh, and so they are trying to block things. Another problem is that the actual cost of uh, uh, mismanagement of water falls on, guess what, the poor people and the environment, right? Two constituencies that don't have very much political power. So uh, they are going to be suffering from mismanagement, but you might need not even hear about it, right? The, the biggest problem of the, in the Netherlands with water is what? What's the biggest problem? Too much of it? No. That's handled, more or less. Wait until my next, uh, it gets worse. But anyway, what's, a, what's a, a problem in the Netherlands? What's the biggest problem that the Dutch can actually, yes, yeah, say that's actually a problem? Rain. What? Rains. Rains. No, that's part of the too much. No, what is it? <laughs> dirty. It's dirty from the farmers, right? Even the Spanish do better than the, the Dutch on water quality because they have no water. But it's because <laughs> there's so much pollution in the Netherlands, but it's hard to overcome the farming lobby, the agricultural lobby, because we're really important and we export food and we feed the world. And you hear the same logic over and over again. So this is why change is hard just on a pure policy perspective. Change is also hard on an academic perspective. right? So uh, any of you have an academic job? You work in a university position, for example? Anyone? Quietly. Anyone thinking about that, maybe? <laughs> they wish they could? OK, so the, this, if, you can, if you can't see this, it says you're f completely free to carry out whatever research you want so long as you come to these conclusions. And this is a, a granting agency. This is the uh, NVO, the Dutch equivalent, the Americans. So money drives a lot of academic research. I'm sorry, but this is true. And even worse, a lot of academics put almost all of their time into this machine called publish or perish. perish, yes. And if you have a blog like me, you get zero academic credits, right? I have 6,000 blog posts, but my, my, my dean does not care. Well, my, my, luckily, my dean does care. That's why I work where I live. But if you work at a research university, blog posts don't work. They don't matter. If you talk to the reporters, it doesn't matter. If you go talk in the, in, the, in the city and you talk to communities that are under distress, that doesn't matter. What you need are publications, publications, publications in journals that no one has heard of, in language that no one can understand, right? If, you, if, if, you, if you've read these publications, those of you who haven't, don't, right? So, uh, and I have had conversations with academics recently. Here's one of them. I'm an assistant professor, so I engaged this guy. I wrote a, he, wrote a, he wrote a paper, then he wrote a blog post about his paper because someone told him he had to. And then I wrote a comment, and this is what he said. I don't have time to reply to your comment, really, because I'm uh, trying to get my, my tenure. I'm trying to do my research. So I'm sorry, I can't tell the world about what I do. I can't engage in a discussion. So academics are the opposite of your Facebook friends. Right? They, 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 no opinions, they're never present. They literally know more than anybody on the topic, but you can never get them in the conversation because that's not a publication. Um, but I'm going, I've been trying to do this because remember what I told you, I'm a bit of a nerd, so I have this thing like I have to actually say things. That's why I'm on stage. So uh, I've tried blogging. I've got Twitter. I've got 3,000 people on my mailing list. Uh, I've, I've got books, and I forgot to bring my books, but I, I, the first book I had I published, 
uh, and it was selling pretty well. I wrote another book, the one that I keep talking about, Living with Water Scarcity. It only sold a couple hundred copies. This is not good. I gave it away for free, right? I need people to read this book. I got volunteers to translate the book into Spanish. Now it's going into Portuguese and French, which is fantastic. So I, that's, in a way, successful. I tried a calendar. The calendar would help you every month learn something about how to improve your water situation. I did this on a Kickstarter. You've heard of Kickstarter? I had backers. I had money. I, 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 could, you know, I, 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 I could pay for the production of this thing. And actually, uh, nobody cared about the calendar, right? I had, uh, I, 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 I kept saying, here's this month's activity. You can do it in schools. Nothing, right? Because people care usually about water when they don't have it. Or in the Dutch case, when they have too much, right? So, uh, and the Dutch are only, they're very lucky that the Katrina flooding happened in, happened in New Orleans, because then the Dutch could say, oh my god, that could happen here. And so, you know, you didn't, have to have, you didn't even have to have a flood to go into the next stage of, of weather preparation. So I'm trying many things. And, and now I want to tell you about, so this is the, now we're coming up again. I'm going to tell you about the projects that I'm working on that you can support in terms of writing. Wait for it. You have to, you have to write. This is a publication, by the way, academics. Writing or, or helping in some way. So one of them is this, this project called Life Plus Two Meters. And, uh, uh, and the idea here is to think about what life would be like in a uh, climate change world. Right? Uh, now, uh, here's an actual uh, part of this same discussion. Uh, what's the IPCC forecast for sea level rise by 2100? Anybody know that? Come on. One meter? One meter? One meter. It's been revised a little bit to two meters. It's been revised a little bit to two meters. They keep talking. Now, now it's official kind of two meters. But uh, there's some punk uh, scientist, like this guy, James, James Hansen. He does climate stuff. And he's like, oh, I think it might be like uh, six to nine meters uh, by 2035 or 2050. And do you know how much uh, flood preparation Rotterdam has by 2100? The plan, you know, the Dutch are very good at planning. You know what the plan is? 80 centimeters. So the most prepared part of the Netherlands for flooding might be totally wiped out in the next 30 years because IPCC has been quite conservative and we're not talking enough about the actual risks. And I, I started this because economists actually don't understand risk very well. This is fantastic paper by this economist Weitzman where he's saying, we have screwed up in six individual separate ways. And if you multiply them all together, we are really fucked. That's basically his concluding statement in 30 pages, right? But it's really worth reading because he's a very nice writer. And I said, we have got to do something about it. So I started this project. And this is the writing imitation. Life plus two meters. How will we live in this different world? Because what I want people to think about and contribute these so-called visions is what will be life be like? How will we adapt or not to uh, changes in sea level, uh, changes in storm patterns, uh, uh, re refugees, all kinds of things? And I have people uh, publishing on this right now. It's all kind of this uh, peer crowdsource kind of thing. And you can go there and read about these visions, or you can actually contribute the visions. Because I want people to be thinking about the eminent future. This is not, they call it client, uh, climate fiction or science fiction. It's kind of like the reality, right? And I think as uh, we, we should start talking about the reality, because that will help us plan ahead. Uh, that's the climate uh, scale. The other one I'm working on, which is not yet launched, is called uh, City Water Project. And my, 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 the next speaker is, is Yank is going to be fantastic at covering this. City Water Project is trying to improve people's understanding of their water quality. Right? You all say you drink the tap water. Anybody uh, gone to a foreign country before? <laughs> Belgium? <laughs> have, you, have you drunk the water from the tap in the foreign country with 100% security? Yes? Or maybe I didn't drink the water from the tap because I wasn't secure? I've been there, done that, right? So I, I started this talk with, it's only a question of money and technology. No, but it's a governance question. So this project is actually to tackle the governance problem. And what we're trying to do from The Hague, where I, we're actually, Leiden University College is in The Hague, just to be very confusing. But what we're trying to do is get a, a, a core group there that organizes to actually have these city campaigns around the world so people can improve their urban water supply. And, and we're going to have these kind of campaigns to go to Cairo or go to Mexico City or whatever. So if you're interested in that, follow that. So this is my attempt to get out of the academic world and be interesting and useful and helpful as a water economist. And that's my contact information uh, if you want to get in touch with me. So 
questions if you want. I can repeat it. The, the question is, where does, your, where does your passion for water come from? Um, that's a good question. I, uh, it's a little bit of, I grew up in California where people talk about water, but almost the same as the Dutch. Um, when I went to graduate school, I was going to do development economics, and I was interested in how governments um, mismanage the drug war. I was going to study drug, uh, coca. Coca is what you make cocaine. And I was going to study coca cultivation in Peru. And I was going to go into Peru and ask the farmers, why are you selling to the narcotraficos? Or why do you sell to the legitimate, like the, the coca chewing market? And some people who are a lot more smart than I said, you will die if you do that topic. And so I, 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 that field research did not happen. And so I, I, I uh, was talking to uh, an advisor, and he said, you know, there's this stupid fight in uh, Southern California about water, and that became my dissertation. It was called Conflict and Cooperation Inside of an Organization. And it's the, the biggest water utility in the United States. So the thing is, is that when I went from government failure in the drug war and government failure in water provision, it's so similar. It's, it's actually, because the drug war is simple to fix, but the water thing is harder. So it's just, no matter how you get into it, it's more interesting and more interesting. So that's why I'm, why I'm still in it. Let's try the microphone. Yeah, the, the, what I mentioned is the, the title of my dissertation is called Conflict and Cooperation Inside of an Organization. And that was because it was a cooperative and it had 27 member agencies, Los Angeles, San Diego, and they kept fighting over who would pay for the system and who would get the water from the system. And I, I said, oh, you can fix this problem by having this nice efficient market. And they said, no, we're just going to keep suing each other in court. But you know, if they sue each other in court, you know whose money that is? The, 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 not the rate payers, the water customers, right? But essentially the taxpayers. So these water managers are wasting millions on stupid things. See one in the back, I think. Yeah. Uh, in, a, in a way, um, if you talk about the oil industry or the energy industry in general, they, there's a discussion called the energy water nexus sometimes. So water is used for energy production. Uh, water is used for oil production. And uh, in those cases, what I say is that um, that's a profit-making enterprise. And they can pay, number one, to uh, source their own water so they don't have to be subsidized on water sources. And they can definitely pay to clean the water that they're using. And they have technology. It's very simple. Tech you can have distilled water coming out of a, a, a uh, what's that called, a refinery uh, if they want to. So it's a question of money, right? So, uh, and it's quite cheap in a way because it costs one, two euros a cubic meter to clean the water. So um, the energy industry, basically, if they pay the, the price, they can clean all the water that they're using and have a very low water impact in terms of the quantity. No. <laughs> And that's the, the, the most interesting question. Why don't they? Uh, because of jobs, because energy has to be cheap, because who cares about the environment anyway? One of the dumbest things they're doing in a lot of parts of the world is they're uh, taking wastewater from fracking and wastewater from other kinds of chemical uh, processing, mining, for example, and they're injecting it into deep aquifers and saying, now it's gone. And uh, the problem with that is that uh, those, some of those places are now seeing those aquifers as water resources called we don't have enough drinking water anymore. And oops, our brackish, you know, a little bit salty water is now full of crazy toxics because we just injected it down there. So there's some dumb things happening with those aquifers. Last question. She had a hand up. Take the hands? Yeah. Okay. Um, my English is not as good, but um, where does the meat uh, uh, district or the, the, the like cowspiracy? Mm -hmm. where yeah, does where does, where, how does meat fi uh, fall into this ca uh, question? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I wrote a review of cowspiracy in my blog, this Agronomics blog, so you can get the longer review of it. But the short version is that 
Um, number one, there's a tremendous amount of pollution resulting from industrial agriculture. And industrial agriculture is usually part of meat production, right? Uh, so um, everything that you see on the, on the outside of the packaging is a lie on the meat and the eggs and all that stuff, right? So most of the time what happens is, uh, and, and the US model is one of the most uh, industrialized. So what happens is you get corn production or soybean production. Both of those use a lot of fertilizers and a lot of chemical pesticides. All of that is really bad in terms of runoff and destroying water quality. That's why they have the, a very, very large dead zone in the end of the Mississippi, like larger than the Netherlands, uh, so no fish. And so that is producing grain. The grain gets used to feed in these uh, confined animal feeding operations, these CAFOs, cows the ca or chickens, and they get big fast. So there's a question of the biology of those animals. Uh, but the biggest problem from the animals besides the greenhouse gases from all of their farts, uh, because they have a bad diet, is that all of the shit they produce ends up, guess what, back in the water. So uh, groundwater is contaminated, surface water is contaminated. So ignoring the entire climate change effect of animal production, the water impacts of, animal uh, of, of industrial animal production are terrible. They're really terrible. My, and, and someone did an estimate of this. I have to take a second because this is really worth it. Someone did an estimate of this, and they said that the price per kilo of pork in the United States, if pork uh, producers were required to follow all the water laws that they're currently exempted from, would be 15 cents a kilo. So they could go from screwing up the environment to literally benign for 15 cents a kilo, which is not very much for a lot of bacon, right? So there's a lot of sadness in the way the policy, which could be actually quite cheap, would allow a pretty sustainable or a more sustainable right, uh, 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 type of food production system. That's just one example. But read the, the review on agronomics. And the free book. And the free book, yes. <laughs> uh, livingwithwaterscarcity.com in Espanol. And if you want to translate it in the other language, talk to me. Thank you so Done? much, yes. David. So, uh, as a don't run off I yet. Stop, yeah. Don't run off yet. You went over time, but you can still get your comic. Okay. We have a we have a good tradition. Uh, so, uh, as a thank you uh, to the speakers, we uh, pick we hand pick a comic book for okay, you. Good. So we picked the massive ninth way for you, and if I uh, read from the the back page. It says, um, so it's a prequel to a story I have to where. Read this now. I have to go. No, 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 I wanna, no, I wanna, no. I wanna say something. <laughs> uh, there, this is a prequel to a story where um, there's a broken world, there's water everywhere, uh, you know, everything happened that you uh, Familiar predicted. Yeah. And then, but before that, uh, they were the preeminent global environmental rescue unit, taking on criminals, polluters, politicians, and rogue states. Thank you very much. There you go. That's special. Thank, Thank you. you.